take that in, you know, not too many people go to that place. But uh, Angkor Wat is absolutely stunning, fascinating, mystical. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't been to, so in Siem Rep, there's actually a Killing Fields venue, which I've, I've mapped out to maybe go to. But I, I really haven't wanted to um, dwell on that part of Cambodian history because, um, you know, there's so, there's so much richness, it, it would be really easy to get stuck on the genocide. Um, yes. And the school, that, the school that you're talking about, I think it's called S21, and that's in Phnom Penh, so that's in the capital that sticks out. I, um, I did. I, but I, I mean, that. It, yes. but, you know, between, between in the 1970s, this country lost half of its population to war and murder. So, and, and so part of my fascination and love for the place um, is a recognition of what they've grown since then. Yes, yes. Well, amazing. Well, let's go ahead and leap into your, um, I guess I would say your, your latest focus, which is called uh, Vita sapien philosophy, Vita meaning life, sapien meaning knowledge. So the knowledge of life, I, I imagine. And, um, you know, I have to commend you, Guy. You've really been at this. And it's a hard thing to stay at, isn't it? And you've been trying to communicate to people, to educate people, to give people tools to handle this breakdown of the biosphere and this extinction event that we're engaged in. So, Guy, without much further ado, why don't you take it away? You can say it so much better than I can. What is Vita Sapien philosophy and what have you been up to about it? So, Vita Sapien started as an idea that hatched in my mind on the 18th of August, 2016, at about 2.30 in the afternoon. And the idea was simply that the climate and ecological crisis ha ha is a spiritual problem. That was the idea. And so the question was, what does the institution of spirituality have to say about the climate and ecological crisis? If you survey all of the spiritualities that are practiced, say, in the Western world today, like whether it's Christianity or it's Islam or it's Hinduism or it's Buddhism or it's New Age spirituality, or if you, if you survey that landscape looking for wisdom about dealing with the Anthropocene crisis, the climate and ecological crisis, what, what does it have to say? And what I found when I made that inquiry is practically nothing, right? Not, not nothing, but practically nothing in the big picture. So my work was to, to basically try and figure out what would a spirituality look like that was tailored specifically for dealing with the climate and ecological crisis. And that's what, that's what Vita Sapien is, which is also called LifeWise. Mm -hmm. I noticed that you introduced a lot of unique terms that are all your own. And you've got basically a whole vocabulary that you have created, kind of invented, in order to grapple with these concepts, right? That's right. So, so, so in 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 creating or sort of looking into this new space, I found that there were ideas that needed to be expressed that for which there weren't existing words, right? So, so one of the words, for example, is ecophony, and ecophony is the idea of a a spiritual awakening to nature, so an ecological epiphany. Um, so I started using that term in 2016. And interestingly, I found that a, um, an, a friend of mine who I shared the idea with had was in an interview and an anthropologist saw the interview and picked up the word and actually put it into the title of a peer-reviewed anthropology paper called from ecophony to collapse. So, so that word has actually now actually found its way into academia wow. and is actually sort of- Congratulations, so, your so words are entering the epiphany, mainstream. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and, and look, here's, here's, another, here's another expression that I use. So we know about near-term human extinction, which is this idea that we're all gonna be dead 
in like five years because of climate and ecological collapse. Well, in my philosophy, um, we have a concept called long-term human extension, right? Which is kind of the opposite. So long-term and extant, extant is the opposite of extinct. So long-term uh -huh. human extension is the idea that humans could be living on this planet 200 million years from now. Okay. So, so in part of my, you know, I've been doing sustainability stuff for 20 years. And one of the things that I've always found puzzling is that when you talk to people about sustainability and ask, how long does it last? How long does sustainability last? Or, right. Everyone, everyone comes up with the number 2100, like 2100, as if getting to the end of the century yeah. is actually the main prize. So when I looked into this, I realized that that our our planet is going to be habitable it's within the, the habitable zone of our star right for another one to two billion years okay beyond which time the sun will consume its fuel and will start to expand out into a red giant and then will eventually bake the whole planet just dry but we've got there's two billion potentially two billion years of life left on this planet and it's not unreasonable to think that if we humans can get our affairs in order, I'll explain that term in a minute, that we can actually live on this planet for a galactic year. And a galactic year is the time that it takes for our solar system to transit one time around the galactic core. And that's around 230 million years. So, so Vita Sapien philosophy or LifeWise philosophy is basically putting um, a stake in the ground and saying this is a philosophy that will allow our civilization to live for 230 million years on earth my goodness that's quite a long time considering the permian mass extinction was 250 million years ago you know we're talking about that same amount of time i don't think anything that's has right. existed no species has existed 250 million years, have, have they? Yeah, at yes. this point? Well, yeah, well, one, one, of, one of the icons that we use in Vita Sapien is that of a, uh, a Nautilus, which is like the octopus in the curly shell. That's, that's, oh. been, around, that's, that's been around 600. That, that's one of the creatures that has remained largely unchanged for 600 million years. Wow. Okay. Okay, oh, there's a there's a there's a sea uh, there's a big fish called a celiacanth that's also been around largely unchanged for I think maybe four hundred million years. Um, yes. And in fact, I was writing about this in the book um, because they caught a celiacanth um, and it had a plastic bag in its stomach. Oh, and so very sad. And, and so this and so this is a really important thing is that. The collapse that we are creating on this planet is is profound and unique in many ways. So the Permian extinction was basically caused by CO2 and methane, like a, a heating event. But we've got the same heating event plus the plastic toxification and plus all of the other chemical industrial toxic waste issues. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to hand it to you, Guy. You are optimistic in a certain way because um you know <clears throat> given the ecological crisis that's happening on this planet and the rapidity with which it is happening i mean this 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 horse has left the stable i'm not sure that we're going to be able to affect anything about this um do you think that there is a chance given how quickly things are changing now how quickly the oceans are getting hot that there is anything human beings can do with vita sapien philosophy to affect this so the the sustainability crisis is a crisis of power all right that's the that's the problem when i say that what i mean is it's not like it's not a lack of resources okay there's an abundance of resources okay if if the western world decided to go to war it would find five trillion dollars in an afternoon right it's not a it's not a problem of technology we've got all the technology we need now to power society sustainably right 
it's just, just not deployed. Um, the problem is power, right? So there is a small number of human beings and corporations that are, have a dominant control over the decision making on the planet. Okay, so ultimately, that power can shift very quickly. And if power shifts quickly, then the whole system can start to stabilize through sensible government policy and funding programs. So, so it is possible to turn the ship very quickly, right? But what we don't yet have is a, a plan of how to actually do that power transition because the powerful people are so damn powerful, right? So theoretically, it's possible to turn the ship very quickly. Practically, I'm not sure how you do that. My model, my theory of change, if you like, and that's a power drill with a ratchet hammer, <laughs> is that if we can raise an army of 50, of 50 million people who are spiritually empowered to protect the ecosystem, right, then there is an alternative power block to match the billionaires. Well, that would be nice if, if that can be done. Um, I, I have little faith just knowing how these corporations and organizations and groups of individuals will grasp onto this power till their dying breath and they will not ever give it up. That's what I'm seeing. They will not allow this power to be wrested from them. And the fact that we're talking about extinction is a threat to that power in any case, you know, because they have to keep the party line going that, you know, nothing's wrong and denialism is rife, you know, more, more so than it used to be. And there's an, an objective around it. Have you seen that denialism has actually increase climate denialism well climate denialism is is actually sort of like a runaway uh, it, you know I mean that was that was fostered that was built that was created the whole idea of creating skepticism about one branch of science where every other branch of science is obviously perfect and don't worry you don't have to you can still fly in a plane because aeronautical science they, they're not the crooks it's just those climate scientists that are, are the crooks. <coughs> <coughs> that was manufactured, okay, manufactured by the these powerful, you know, oil companies. I mean, there's books Definitely. been written about it. So, two things I want to say though is, firstly, the extinction event, right, is a piece of gravity and logic and rationality that the powerful people can't escape, right? Because at the end of the day, the truth is their business plan is killing the planet and that's ultimately going to kill them. That logic and rationality is like a, a, an overbearing pressure. The point that I was making was that sustainability is a crisis of power and that the powerful people, the fossil fuel industry, for example, controls 80% of the world's energy supplies right now, okay? But the point that I want to make is that renewable energy, solar and wind in particular, are so cheap that the, the power of the fossil fuel industry is falling away, okay? So the power transition is, is coming. It's already underway. The question is whether it happens fast enough to make a meaningful difference with respect to the climate and ecological crisis. So, so this is a point that, this is a very important part of Vita Sapien philosophy, is that we may have already gone past the climate tipping points, the cascade of climate tipping points. So we may have already doomed our civilization, our race, our species, and most species on, on, on Earth to extinction, okay? May, right? But may not also. There may also be an opportunity to get out of this mess to actually transition into a sustainable civilization with enough intact ecosystem to have a stable planet. Okay, so there's two potential futures. 
And my argument against doomers who say there's nothing we can do, it's all, it's all finished, right, is that they are assuming that they have the crystal ball, right, where they don't, right? Nobody knows what the future is. But what I'm saying is that there is still yet time to effect profound change. And what Vita Sapien is trying to do is to try and tap into the spirituality of humans to make forcing that change a spiritual mission. And the reason why spirituality is important in this quest is it is the most powerful motivator of human behavior. And it's like a super weapon that has been overlooked by the environmental movement. Wow, that's that's pretty amazing. So in essence, this would take a 100%, 180 degree change in the way we are as human beings. We would have to learn to feel. We would have to learn to contend, to look at truth, to change our behavior. It would have to be an absolute, irrevocable change never going back and we'd stop we'd have to stop having so many children as well i mean population is a big concern what do you think about where we're at and our chances of contending with this because population is one thing that really does concern me because <clears throat> it's going up very very sharply and you know, the more people there are, the more resources are going to be used and it just kind of goes on and on and on. I mean, if you're a bargaining so, man, <clears throat> what, what, what do you think the likelihood is that we could affect a change in human behavior that would actually change our fate for the better? So religious people, like, Think for a moment about born again Christians on a street corner and you walk past and they say, Jesus loves you. And you go, oh, really? And you go with them. You know, in the recruitment of the born again Christians, they bring about a profound behavioral change in their recruits in the space of a few weeks. All right. By appealing to spirituality. Okay, spirituality is a tool that you can use to affect profound and lasting behavioral change in human beings. The born again Christians know that. ISIS knows that. They take a, a kid off the street, 20 year old, who doesn't care about anything but football and smoking cigarettes, and he will be a, a suicide bomber in four months, appealing oh to God. spirituality. Okay. So, so what I'm saying is that spirituality is the ultimate super weapon for the environmental movement, but it is completely overlooked. That's point number one. Secondly, is 96% of the time that humans have had spirituality, which is around 70,000 years, it evolved around 70,000 years ago. I can explain that. For 96% of that time, our spirituality has been firmly grounded in the local ecosystem, right? So caring about the planet or that part of the planet that you live in is intrinsic to human beings. So we're not trying to create something extraordinary and new and, and, and we're just trying to go back to the root that is already seeded in us over thousands of generations of, and millions of years of evolution. So that's, those, those are two points. Firstly, is that it's already there within us. And secondly, you can affect profound behavioral change just by making spirituality change. And when I say spirituality change, what I'm talking about is getting people to connect spiritually to nature, to sit in front of a tree and learn the wisdom of the tree, right? To watch this, the moon rise. So we, we, we advocate for... <clears throat> full moon parties to go and gather with people and actually find like go and look on online to find when and where the full moon rises and watch it because there is a psychological phenomena called the moon illusion that makes the moon seem much much bigger than it is when it rises above the horizon okay you, you've got to mm -hmm. see it within the first 20 minutes of the moon rise otherwise beyond that the moon illusion is lost okay these are these are profound 
peak experience tools that nature has provided us that Vita Sapien is just trying to get people to connect to because as soon as you start connecting to the wisdom of the tree, to the full moon rise, to these other pathways, I call them um, portals, right? Then, then your spirituality changes and, and, and then your behavior changes with it. I think that when people are ready to do something like that, they can do it. I just don't see it happening on mass. But that being said, I'm not a skeptic. I heard that, uh, I think in one of the things I, I listened to you, 52 million latent members of Vita Sapien, when you were filling out your paperwork, how many potential members? So can you talk to me about what's, is that a critical mass number in your mind? Where did you get the number 52 million people would essentially be waking up and changing their behavior and be able to affect the, the fate of our earth and our biosphere? Talk to me about that and, and how people can embody the Vita Sapien philosophy to actually affect change. So, yeah, so the, the number 50, 53 million latent Vitans, that's the proper terminology. So in, as I was submitting the paperwork to the Charity Commission to set the Vita Sapien organization up, they said, how many followers do you have? And I said, well, you know, not many because we're just getting started. But I said, you know, there is potentially a quarter of the cultural creative people will adopt this as their primary life philosophy. That was the idea. So cultural creative is a term that was created by uh, an American sociologist and um, uh, psychologist working together, uh, working on projects for the Amer American Environmental Protection Agency to figure out how to communicate environment to the American public. And what they found was that there were three psychographics in America, psychographic being a way that people see the world, okay? And so 55% of the American public were moderns who basically don't see that there's a problem to be solved. And so they're good at dealing with day-to-day -day activities. They're good with finance. They tend to have modern cars, right? But then there was about 35% of the public were what they call cultural creatives. And these are people that you'd refer to as the left or the creative or the RT, you know, the, you know, and the 35% the of, the, of the American public, and this translates to the Western world as a whole, not just America, 35% of the adult public are cultural creatives. And there's a, in the book, there's like a little questionnaire that if you answer in the positive 10 out of 19 questions, you're a cultural creative. Do you care about women? Do you care about children? Do you care about the planet? Do you care about indigenous people? Pretty basic stuff for empathic, you know, left-leaning people. So my model says that a quarter of the cultural creative people will understand this work and say, that is my primary view of the world in the, in, in, through the lens of spirituality and worldview. Mm -hmm. And that represents 53 million people in the Western world and that is around 8% of the Western adults. And 8% of Western adults, when they get a bone in their mouth or a, 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 an idea in their head, that is a, an extremely powerful political and economic force. Hmm. So um, it sounds good, potentially. How do you plan to let people know about this integrated philosophy. And I'm sure that there are many people thinking along these lines, right? <clears throat> Not necessarily Vita Sapien, but you know, that things have to go through a radical shift. Um, how, how, what role do you see Vita Sapien playing and how do you plan to spread the word and get adaptation of this philosophy? Yeah, so, so we, are, we are out of time. So if Vita Sapien is going to have an effect at changing the trajectory of human civilization, which is what the game is, that's why I created it, right? It needs to be massively boosted. 
and massively boosted it need, means it needs to be properly funded. And that ultimately comes down to dollars and cents, right? It would be nice to think that an idea like this would just take off like wildfire, but good ideas don't take off like wildfire because they're surrounded by millions of bad ideas that are fully funded. <laughs> so, so ultimately, in order for this project to take effect, it needs to be funded. And, and so I set up a charity, a registered charity, so I've got a vehicle through which I can accept the donations to then start engaging professional communication people and marketing people and public relations people and tech people and we set up a studio and we start doing 24 hour a day online programming, okay? And then we basically blast out onto the world stage. We get a publicist so that we can get articles in Vanity Fair and all of the major journals. The, you know, we get PR people that will get us into TV stations so that we can have Vita Sapien people doing analysis of world events. A dark green billionaire to fund the work. And that way we can take the idea, which is now well thought through and well written down, and then blast it all over the planet like a rocket launch. I hope that you can succeed. <laughs> I am not passively just kind of marching to extinction, but I think just probably by looking at this problem for the last 10 years very closely, <laughs> it, it leaves me feeling rather gloomy because I don't see any change and I see the environment completely falling apart, especially this last year with the big rises in sea temperature and air temperature. We're basically going off the charts now and it's going to take a pretty darn strong force in the other direction, everybody all at once to affect any change at all not saying that Vita Sapien couldn't do it. Um, it's a noble, a noble thought. But um, I, I guess I'm not entirely convinced because I, I don't mean to be a hardened doomer. Um, but I, I have been looking at this um, predicament that we find ourselves in for well over 10 years now. And, and I only see it getting worse and exponentially worse at that. Does that depress you? Um, I, I read the same data as, as you read, okay? So I have that same stock of knowledge, but I, I read other data as well. So I read about the, the, the fact that um, batteries for electric vehicles are gonna drop in, the price is gonna drop in half in the next 18 months. And the fact that renewable energy is just so much cheaper than fossil fuels. And, and I started to study billionaires. There's only 2,600 billionaires on the planet. So that's not a large number of people that you need to get into their heads to get them to change their investment opportunities, right? I, I read about how the biosphere is, is maintains its homeostasis, that there are me mechanisms within the planet to keep the planet stable. So I guess what I'm saying is that if you only read the bad news, you're going to come up with the view that there is nothing can be done and it's a one-way street to extinction. But when you read the full spectrum of the news, you realize that there is opportunities here that we can play with, that we still have time, but that as time progresses, we need more and more a harsher medicine, right? And this is obviously the reason why we need to be in action as soon as possible. But the point is that the game that we are risking losing, okay, is not just is not just losing human civilization. Is that what we've actually set in motion? Is we'll take down most life on Earth, like a rerun of the Permian extinction. We're going to rerun the Permian extinction. And I mentioned before about the Celiacan fish that have been around 400 million years, and they caught one with a plastic bag in its stomach. So we've, we're creating an extinction event, which is the most will be the most profound extinction event on Earth out of all of the previous five, right? And that is a profoundly spiritual issue. And this is the point that I'm trying to make is that when you tap into that spirituality, you can turn a, a human being, a regular run-of-the-mill human being into a, into a machine 
of planet-saving, vibrant activity. All right, and so and that and that's really what I'm trying to explore in this work, and that's the that's the seed that I've I've conceived and I've dug out of the ground, and now I need the resources to water it and turn it into a massive tree. Okay, so mm. I, I've got no doubt that we can turn the ship. No, I have mm. no doubt that we can turn the ship and establish an ecological civilization. I have no doubt that that is possible, right? I don't have the resources to do it, but I've got tools that didn't exist five years ago. Like what tools didn't exist five years ago that you're using? Vita Sapien philosophy. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a noble quest and um, I really hope that you are able to get some funding and get some interest. <clears throat> what are some actions that would come out of the Vita Sapien philosophy that we could do um, to try and affect saving our world? So um, that's, that is already been, well, that, that question has already been answered in many, many places, okay? So, so, so I'll answer it in two ways. Firstly, we need to euthanize the fossil fuel industry, all right? Euthanize What's the, the likelihood of that? <laughs> huh? Can it well, be done? So, so, yeah, well, they, they, they're self-euthanizing, right? They're just doing it slowly, okay? So, so they're already destroying the ecosystem that forms the basis of the economy that they sell their oil into. All right. So they're already self-euthanizing. So what we're going to do is going to speed it up and make it orderly as we transition to alternative energy sources and the disciplined use of energy so we can use maybe a half or, or maybe third as much energy by being efficient and then transition to the alternative renewable energy sources, right? That's a big game, right? But that can be affected over half a century if only we can take control and power over those institutions and those individuals, all right? And all, the, all they need to do, if the board of BP, right, got Vita Sapien one day, right, they could make policy changes that shifts the, their investment strategy that within 20 years they'd be a, re a renewable energy company. Right. So, so what, what is actually required to fix the problem is really just an idea in the head of the right people. Okay. It's not like some massive, the question is, how do you get that idea into those people? Or how do you find a force which is powerful enough to actually get rid of them and replace them? Right. So there's, so that, okay. So I could, I could talk about the, the, me the mechanisms that we need to do in order to establish an ecological civilization. Okay. We need to draw down a trillion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere to restore the climate. We need to rewild a third of the planet. Now, these, are, these are established things. You can read that in the Vita Sapien work, right? But the question is, how do we get there? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And the way that you get there, if you're listening to this and you're interested in being a part of this, right, is you go onto the web, onto the internet, and you type in the name of your town and the word full moon rise, and then you look and find out when the full moon is going to rise and you figure out what um, azimuth or what where it's going to rise okay and you gather with a few of your friends and you watch the full moon rise if you do that and and you can do that every month cloud cover notwithstanding that is the pathway to connect you spiritually to the planet right if you go and find a beautiful tree and you sit with it that is a pathway to connect you spiritually to the living planet. If you go and find a place I refer to as a nest, which is a, a somewhere that you can go where, where you can't see things that humans have made, where you can't hear the traffic and you can't hear the noise of the town and all you can see is nature, okay? And you go there and you sit there quietly, turn off your devices, okay? That will connect you spiritually to nature. And these spiritual connections to nature will connect you into the heart of the planet, which will give you the power to do everything that you need to affect the change. Hmm. Wow. 
Well, I I did watch the full moon rise this last full moon. I was driving back from the grocery and I was driving east and it was just there right on the horizon. It, it, it was so, it took my breath away. And I don't yeah. know if this time of year, the full moon is, is any bigger than any other time of year, but it was absolutely huge and it was glorious. And it is a very uplifting experience to watch the full moon. That is for sure. Yeah. So um, the, the orbit of the moon around the earth um, has that it is closer to the Earth sometimes, and other times it's further away. So if you ever hear of a supermoon, that's basically when the moon is actually like at 10% closer than it normally is, and so it seems a little bit bigger still. And of course, you know, the thing about the full moon rise is it's very, um, it's mathematically precise. You can, you know, exactly within the minute when it will rise above the sea horizon but you can't always tell whether it's going to rise above your horizon because you might have hills in the way or urban areas and buildings. Um, and, um, and, um, and, and the other thing is that the, the, this is fascinating. So the, as the moon rotates around the Earth, the moon rotates around its own axis at the same rate as it's rotating around the Earth. So you always see the same face of the moon it doesn't change and what it's that uncanny means is isn't that when, it it's it's amazing that's what they call yeah, the quote and, dark side of the moon of course it's not dark at all but for some reason the moon is 100 percent in synchronicity as it rotates around our earth and we only see one face of the moon which is kind of spooky that's right that's right so if you go back and look at galileo's work or um uh, tycho tycho bar tycho one of the, the very first guys back in like 1500 that pioneered telescopes, uh, Tycho Bray, I think his name is, was like an early astronomer. And they, or, or Galileo, I think also had telescopes. And, and he's got sketches of the moon, right? It's exactly the same moon as we see today. All right. And so, so it, it, it bonds us across the planet and it bonds us across time, yeah? And here's it another does. fascinating feature. If you, if you imagine that the moon is small but close and the sun is big but far, when they line up, they're almost exactly the same size. All right, now I, I don't that's, know how that's to explain That's another that crazy thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so I guess what I'm saying, I'm trying to, I'm trying to connect the, the, the root of the work that I'm doing is twofold, is to connect people spiritually to, to planet Earth, to nature, specifically the biological part of it, not so much the, you know, the seismic part or the rocks, okay? And second is to advise people using environmental science. And those two things together, right, is the powerful tool that can have the humans get through this climate and ecological crisis. But in order to effect that, what I want to do with the resources that I need is to build programs that we bring people in to give them that powerful experience. So they come into the program, whether it be a program that lasts for an hour or a day or a week, that they come in, they get infused with this wonder and glory of earth and advised or, or given a trust of the environmental sciences that can go out into their, into their world and they will figure out what they should do to drive the biggest change that's possible. That's what I call it. It's like you're, you're having like an intervention with humanity to make them sane again, to bring them back to what they should know already, right? Well, it's what the born again Christians do, but they, but they give you all of this bullshit story about Jesus loves you and they take 10% of your pre-tax income, okay? So, so, so this, this game of, of, of fostering radical behavioral change through spirituality change has been going on for thousands of years, right? Just okay. the environmental movement, the environmental movement never picked up on it. All right. So if you just take the model of the born again, Christian, it meets you on the street. Jesus loves you. Oh, that's good because my girlfriend threw me out come to the church, fucking speaking in tongues, 
put the hand on you. Here's the tray. Give us 10% of your pre-tax. Okay, I know this because I was a, I got hooked up with one of these born again Christian groups when I was 17 years old. I went through a radical behavioral change in the space of weeks. I started reading the Bible every day. I used to go out on the street telling people that Jesus loved them, right? I, I went to church three times a week. Radical behavioral change. They didn't teach me anything. They appealed to my spirituality. They appealed to the idea of why was I here? Where did I come from? What happens when I die? You understand? And when mm. you appeal spiritually, right, and you effect spirituality change, that begets radical environmental change. And up until the work that I've done with Vita Sapien, there hadn't been a spiritual tool that was focused on climate and ecological collapse. And there is now. Well, um, hopefully, you know, you can affect change that it'll go beyond somebody having an awakening because that's what you're asking for <clears throat> is for each person to go through the crisis of awakening and connectivity, connecting with their environment, understanding that we are part of the environment, not separate from the environment. That's exactly how right. yeah. I, I just hope that that awareness, which is critical to get to, I admit, can actually affect a change because I've never seen <clears throat> anything affect the trend. And what, what worries me most about this is that there's so much momentum behind yeah. this ecologic breakdown that we are engaged in. There's so much momentum. You know, it's up to the point when I when I first started my research, they said, well, the amount of heat going into the climate system was four Hiroshima bombs per second. It's now up to 16, just 10 years later. And that is how much heat is getting left in our climate system. There's a huge giant energy imbalance and the trend is a very, very difficult thing to contend with, not to mention the latent heat that's, you know, in, in carbon dioxide. It's going to take 10 to 15 years to real, <clears throat> realize the heat. Yeah, the lag. Yeah. The lag, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, between that and the amount of heat that's already in there and the extreme weather breakdowns and the runaway population and just the absolute messed up political geopolitical situation that we have that you know it's like the world has gone crazy it really is guy i mean given all that what's your hope well like like i say i mean you've just listed 10 negative like there's like a, it's like a it's like a it's like a balance sheet or a ledger you've got all this negative shit that you've just listed perfectly and you spend a, and you spend you're good you know that stuff but i'm telling you on the other side of the ledger there's a whole bunch of stuff right like battery technology is now advanced to the point that the cost of an electric vehicles battery is going to drop in half next year solar and wind power is now cheaper than fossil fuels there is an in, there is a logical gravity of economics which is pushing fossil fuels out of the planet. But the fossil fuel industry is finished. It's just not dead yet. It's still dominant, but it's on its way out. And, and, and the tools that I've been trying to create, the Vita Sapien philosophy and the spirituality connected to nature and business has yet to actually arrive on the scene in a, any meaningful way because it's not funded. So what I'm saying is that if you just list 10 reasons why we are fucked, you're gonna conclude that we're fucked. Right, but if you list them and then you list the other things, then you start to see that there's a balance, and that, and that creates a motivation for action that you don't have if you only think that we're fucked and do everything that we can to fix this mess. I mean, remember, apart from anything else, is that we are all complicit in having killed this planet, right? Particularly the Western people, and particularly the Western people that have got the wherewithal to you know, have decent jobs and technologies. The Western people are the most consuming um, 
people of the entire history of human beings, okay? The amount of carbon that an average Western person puts into the atmosphere or plastic that they consume is just off the charts compared to nearly everybody else on the whole planet. So if nothing else, we have a responsibility to the ecosystem to pay back the debt that we have actually incurred by living our Western lifestyles, all right? So that's another part of it, but that's not a part that I push because that is not a great motivator to say that people have a debt that they need to pay when they didn't know they had a debt. But my point is that if we see ourselves as a part of the living planet, then that calls upon us to behave with respect to the living planet in a particular way. And the way now is nothing short of radical and revolutionary because of the state of the planet as you've just described, okay? So, so what I'm saying is that if, we are, if we're gonna have a chance to affect this change, we need to get our skates on big time, right? As many people who, who, who understand that it's possible to turn this ship need to do everything they can to fix this mess. And that is a, a powerful way of living, right? The, you know, the idea that you plant a, a plant a seed in the ground that will, grow, that will grow a tree that you will never get to sit in the shade of, all right? This battle will, be, can, will continue for a century at least, all right? This battle to, to prevent the collapse of the global ecosystem will outlast everybody who is listening to this podcast, to this video. All right. And, and that is the most noble way that you can live your life is to participate in the battle to protect Mother Nature. That is your life support system. And the more people who are participating and, tur and turning their whole lives over to this thing. All right. The more people that are doing that, the better chance we'll actually fix it. Talking about the Vita Sapien tools, the Vita Sapien philosophy, the ideas is that if you can foster somebody to have that ecological awakening, that transforms their life. And all we need to do is to foster ecological awakening in millions of people, and then nature takes over because it's already inside them to do whatever they can do to figure it out, complex and adaptive systems to go and figure out what they can do to actually contribute to make the world a better place, recognizing that we may have already lost the race. Well, I mean, we're not doing anything else. We might as well fight. I mean, you know, we might as well engage, right, guy? Well, it's 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 honourable, right? You know, you know, they say you don't fight you don't fight um, fascists because you think you can overthrow the fascist regime. You fight fascists because that's the right thing to do. Right? It's, it's simply the right thing to do. And when you use the word right, okay, not rational or logical, I'm saying right, if you use the word right, you're actually speaking spiritual language. Because right, what is right is something that is built into us. It's a spiritual thing. Okay? The right thing to do if you live today, okay, is to transform your life, to be, do everything you can to protect the collapse of the ecosystem. Right? And you don't do that because, 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 rational, rational, rational. You do that because it's the right thing to do. It's an honourable thing to do. Mm. Even though we may have already triggered the cascade of climate tipping points, which is going to take our planet to six, seven degrees Celsius above baseline and eradicate most life on Earth over the coming decades and century. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's likely. I really do. And I don't think it's just because I'm looking at the negative. I just, I just see the trends and I'm not saying this is where we're going. I'm just looking at exactly what is happening and connecting the dots and extrapolating it out. If there was any wobble or any variation within that trend, you know, I would say otherwise, but right now, the way things are, especially like the last year, we are in, it feels like a very accelerated situation, you know? Yeah. And it's going yeah. to take yeah. a lot to cool down the ocean. The ocean has 
absorbed. It's so hot. You know, the ice sheets are melting. The, the ocean is, is getting hotter and hotter all the time, and it's holding on to its heat. And that is the thing that disturbs me the most. Yeah, like, I'm not, I, I, I'm, not, I'm never going to downplay the severity of the crisis. Uh, and I've been watching this. I started doing climate stuff um, in 2000. So I've been, I've been engaged in this for 20 years, 24 mm -hmm. years. Um, and it, there has been a significant uptick in um, the, uh, the observable impacts over the last three years and particularly 2023. Like 2023 was off the charts in so many different ways. So I'm not trying to under, I'm not trying to downplay the severity of the crisis. I understand it very, very deeply. I, and in fact, in fact, I'm constantly finding uh, new aspects of the crisis that I hadn't understood before. I mean, you can just drill down into the insect apocalypse. You know, in in the book that I've just written, there's a chapter there where I've listed about a dozen science papers. And one of the science papers was saying that um, every um, uh, every 20 years, uh, for the last century, every 20 years, the amount of stuff that humans produce uh, doubled, right? So you've got like the 3% growth in the global economy and the production of um, uh, technosphere is the term that they use to describe stuff that humans make, so all the concrete and steel and plastic. So in the year 2020, the amount of stuff that humans have made exceeded the mass of everything that lives on planet Earth. Right? Well, how do you contend with that? More... I mean, so difficult. Well, how, how yeah. is this so, going to so stop? So he... Well, so what that means is that 20 years from now, if the insane people continue doing what they want to do, which is to grow the global economy, right? There's going to be twice as much stuff as there is living things on the planet. So, so at the heart of at the heart of this, come back to the point that I made before, right? Is that that logic, right, um, is a roadblock to continuing what we're doing. It just doesn't make sense to do what we're doing, right? The model is broken. Right? Now, if you ignore the fact that the model is broken and just keep doing it, which is the pattern of the global elite, right? then obviously the problem is going to get worse and worse and worse. But, it, but that doesn't stop the, the logic and the, the gravity of the logic is there. Right? The only logical and rational way out of this is to transition the planet's economy into a blue economy. That's the term that I like to use, blue economy as per Gunter Pauli. Um, blue economy as opposed to blue economy and economy of the ocean, the sustainable blue economy, which is basically, you know, we, we're still going to need goods and services. We're still going to need to move around and eat things and so forth, but we just need to transition to the sustainable version. And that's already well underway. I mean, just read about, so I'll give you an example, right? So I've got this um, little model that I designed the other day. I had this graphic design guy create a 3D model and I want to get this thing printed with 3D printing. Right, but I didn't want to use like polypropylene or PLA or the normal 3D print fabrics or um, filament they call it. So I did a bit of Google sustainable 3D. There's this new product on the market. I was doing 3D printing two and a half years ago, and this has shown up since then. And it's called PHA, and it's a type of plastic that is actually grown by bacteria in a vat. Right. And this material is, has all of the normal qualities of a 3D print material. It's plastic, it's a thermoplastic, so it melts and then you shape it and then it turns into a solid object. But if you decide that you don't want the solid object, you just throw it in the garden and the worms eat it. It's fully biodegradable. No. My gosh. Okay. Well. So, so, so there's plenty of biodegradable plastics around, right? But this one is grown in a vat and it's this whole new chemistry that they found, right? So this is, the part, this is where we're going. And, in, and particularly in Europe, and in particularly in Scandinavia in Europe, this stuff is already really, really advanced. It's just not taken over yet because 80% of the world's energy comes from the fossil fuel industry and the people, the human beings, the individual human beings that run those industry are insane sociopaths, 
okay <laughs> so so as soon as as soon as that power shifts away then this other thing rises up and that other thing will rise up extremely quickly because of all the, the tools of capitalism and finance and and technology and mass production and supply chains so what i'm saying is that when when the positive change happens it will happen so fast that it will blow your brains out okay i was at cop 28 okay this is the un climate talks that have been hijacked by the fossil fuel industry right so basically they said full steam ahead to do fossil fuels but they gave two uh they threw a few little coins in the bucket to satisfy the world that they weren't completely heartless one of which is that they're going to triple the amount of renewable energy on the planet by 2030 triple renewables by 2030 now i'm not saying that that is good that that comes with its own problems right renewable energy is not as sustainable as it could be there is a lot of supply chain there's a lot of plastics there's a lot of concrete a lot of steel a lot of minerals a lot of mining a lot of um, rare earth elements involved in the production of renewables but the thing is once you've built your renewable machine it just generates electricity practically for free for the next 30 years right so we have the, the issue called energy return on energy investment right now it takes about something in the order of about nine months of of using a solar panel for it to generate as much energy as was required to produce the solar panel which means if it runs for 25 years you've got 24 and a bit years of, of, of mm -hmm. free energy okay it's 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 imperfect i was reading the other day that wind turbines um the big blades okay as they flap around in the breeze they actually shed microplastics into the environment because you're breaking great out of surface okay so so this so renewable energy is not without its problems okay i fully accept that and if you put wind farms in the wrong place you'll kill endangered birds and endangered bats okay so the, the point that I'm trying to make is that when the change comes, okay, it is going to explode and it will dizzy people's heads. You know, okay, because it's very easy to uh, see how fucked we are and uh, less easy to see a way out of this mess. But what we are set to lose if we mess this thing up is, is to basically annihilate most life on this planet. That's, 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 that's what we do if we do that's what happens if we do nothing right if we can if we can shift this trajectory the the opportunity is that our our people our race human beings and the creatures and animals and plants that we share this planet with can be playing together for millions of years into the future and that is a powerful powerful story that is a powerful story and um Best of luck to you. I'm so honored that we've had the chance to talk about these things today. It's very, very important. Nothing could possibly be more critical. And let's all hope that we can have a revolution of consciousness to affect um, the principles behind the Vetus Sapien philosophy. I wish you the absolute right. best, Guy. And keep up the good Thank fight you. there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.